to the Clock and Talk, an Arsenal podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. And follow us on Twitter at Clock and underscore Talk. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and listen to us on all good podcast apps. Um, we've got a couple of games to talk about this week, but we will touch briefly on the Bato game. Um, Tony, we're through to the Europa League, and before we go down that path, though, I better introduce you two clowns. Uh, Tony, how are you, mate? I was going to say, I don't even get an introduction anymore. Things are slipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Uh, good weekend, good to see Arsenal win in the sun. Spoiler, if you haven't watched the Southampton game, we won. Um, but yeah, all good. All good, all good. And Schwinn, you've you've uh, you've landed to the mother country, mate. I have indeed. It's been a few days since I've been roaming around the streets of London and hanging out with uh, my fellow podcaster Tony. So it's it's been a lot of fun. And of course, the the result yesterday puts the cherry on the icing. And I, I noticed the weather's been kind to you as well, mate. It has been. It was a lovely day yesterday, and it has been for the past couple of days, to be fair. So it seems it doesn't seem like February at all. Uh, the sun's out, the, the skies are clear, and yeah, just all in all, just all positive out here. Very nice. Um, okay, boys, so as I said, Tony, we'll touch very quickly on the Bateau game, mate. Basically, we got through, and going into the game, I was a little bit nervous. Oh, I mean, I was never worried we was going to go through. Um, I thought we may we could have got a bit nervous if they resisted the first goal for a bit longer, but I think it was four minutes when the own goal went in. And after that, it was just... You could have... I think both teams would have probably agreed to stop the match there and let us go through. And it kind of played out a bit like that. They didn't really come to play. We knew it was a matter of time. And, and that's how the game was. It was quite, quite a boring game to watch, to be fair, because it was just everyone sort of settled for what was going to happen after about five minutes. And I mean, there, there's certain players that just essentially stop playing after like 10 minutes. It's like, oh, we're going to go through. There's no point using too much energy. I don't mind that as much as it was boring sitting there to watch. I don't mind players not really trying. And like, we've got a lot of games. We've got four games in 10 days. So that was the first. So they've got to conserve energy somewhere. So I don't mind them strolling about as long as they get the job done, which they did. So, but it just made it really shit to watch. Kickoff time didn't help. 5.55 is not a good kickoff time. I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. I think we've got some questions about Europa League draw. Okay. Um, look, like I said, we won't go into much detail. Uh, I, I, I know your man of the match. You probably know my man of the match. So we'll let the listeners know your man of the match. Jacka. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say it first because everyone would go, oh, fucking Tez on his granite fucking bandwagon again. So, <laughs> but, uh, To be fair, he, he was our best player, but it wasn't like a, I mean, I said this to you the other day, it wasn't like a, a vintage performance because no one played, like no one was at 100%. He he was the best on the pitch, so you give him man in a match, but it wasn't like a, he bossed the game because there wasn't a game there to be bossed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, look, I thought he was good. He was consistent and... and uh, it was just a really good performance all around. Um, I'll just touch quickly on Ozil because he was back in the starting lineup. Your thoughts on his performance? Um, I thought he was good. I thought he was probably one of our better players. Um, he didn't take the game by the scruff of the neck, but as I said, no one did. And it, obviously, when players around you aren't really playing as well, it's difficult to to have a high tempo, free flowing game. But what he done, he done really well. He combined well with with um, Aubameyang and, and with Xhaka through the middle. Um, you could see the football's a lot better with him there, and you could see that even against. And, and, and the argument was obviously, ah, oh, it's poor opposition in Barte. But you could see we're a lot more fluid. We flow a lot better with him in the team. He's much better combinations. Um, I, I look, I, once again, I haven't looked at the questions, so... You'd pull me up if I'm going down the long, wrong track here and uh, somebody's already asked the question. Um, we're being kind for the next draw by the looks of it. I'm happy with that. I just can't remember. Um, there was something about when the draw released, uh, the home and away fixtures were swapped around. I heard a lot of Arsenal fans upset because they booked some tickets already. Um, and then, I don't know if you've seen the reports or whatnot, but and then they switched the home and away around, so we were going to play the first leg there, and then they switched it. Uh, so 
yeah, we're at home second. Um, yeah, so basically, UEFA announced before the draw, whatever order you're drawing in, if your team comes out first, that means you're at home for the first leg and away for the second leg. Um, so Arsenal came out first. It was drawn Arsenal v Ren. Um, everyone already knows the dates. So every a lot of fans booked their flights out because the earlier you book the flights, the cheaper they are. So they booked their flights out there. Uh, and then about an hour, an hour and a half after the draw, UEFA announced that Arsenal and Chelsea aren't allowed to play at home on the same day, despite them doing it literally the day before. Um, Crazy. I know Arsenal fans had a, Arsenal had a big complaint about the 5.55 kickoff time. It just doesn't work with a city like London. There was, there was people turning up at 6.45, so they've missed basically the first half uh, because they couldn't get out of work or they got to travel across London when they finish work. Um so Arsenal had previously complained about that. So UEFA took it upon themselves to switch the games. Uh, left quite a few fans out of pocket. And to be fair, if I was Wren or a Wren fan, I would be furious because it's a huge advantage to be at home in the second leg. I know from the early kickoffs in Thursday, which we were one of, I think there was 10 games and every team that played the second leg away won, went through the tie. They might not have won the game, but they went through the tie. Mm. Um, I think of the 16 ties, I think there was only two clubs that were home first that won the, the, the tie. And then Ren have just been switched when they sh- the draw has actually been in their favour. So I'd be furious if I was them. I mean, for as Arsenal, it's a, obviously a good good thing that's happened. It's not so great for, for some fans. I mean, it's been a Schwinn's uh, detriment as well. So he's had a little moan about it. OK, well, let us know what your thoughts on it all, Schwinn. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, there, there's obviously bigger things at play here, and Tony obviously spoke about that. You know, it's not easy to to make those bookings and, and then have to do away with that money. But um, I mean, my whole issue with this was that, you know, the way I planned my trip was to watch these five games while I'm here, and that us going through in the previous round meant that the first leg could have been at home for us, which meant that I could have caught an additional game while I'm here. So I don't stand to lose a lot because my travel has been booked and I'm here anyway till after United. But for people who've already booked, you know, whether it's the French fans coming here or for um, Arsenal fans going to France, for them, it's, it's, it's a lot of money. And, you know, we often forget that sometimes people will travel with their families and, you know, it's the cost of four people. So just a match day itself can, can be heavy on the pocket. So when you lose money like that and there's no way to recover that, that's a big blow to fans. So I I definitely empathize you know sympathize with them more than I you know than I do with myself in this situation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit shit, isn't it? To be honest with a few fans and that, I I, I really feel for them. Uh, thoughts though on going through the next stage. Who is it? Ren? Is that his? Yeah. Uh, Ren? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thoughts there, Tony? You you're pretty confident, mate? We'll get the result. Uh, I mean, we should do, but they're they're a strange side in that they're they're, they're quite they're leaky at the back. They attack quite well. You look at the the league, and I think they're tenth or eleventh or something like that, or they were before the weekend. But then they've got some dangerous players. I mean, Ben Arthur's doing well for them, and, and he absolutely hates Unai Emery, so I'm sure that will give him uh, some extra motivation before the game. Um, they're not. It's not as easy as it as it looks when you see you're playing a tenth or eleventh side. Uh, place in France, but we should win. We're obviously expected to win. Mm-hmm. You agree with that, Shrek? I know very, very little about Ren uh, <laughs> on paper. Me uh, either. I know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's the case with most Europa League opposition. But you know, Bate is someone we played recently, so you have a little more to go off of there. But yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll go with Tony's word on this because I haven't seen them play at all this year. And, I mean, if you asked me to even make a guess on where they were on the table, I'd, I'd have no idea. So, um, on paper, the tie obviously fancies us, but, you know, it's all to do with how we perform on the day and what we can get away from the first leg. Yeah, I, I, I had a look at, obviously, when the, the draw was on, who they were and that, but didn't learn much about it. But then I noticed bloody um, Monica bloody lifted off the relegation too, so I was like, oh, shit. Uh, but anyway, that's a different topic. So, um, okay, let's. So that's a little bit of Europa League wrapped up there. So we won't go much more into that. Uh, we'll get into this Southampton game, Tony. Uh, your thoughts on the lineup, mate? 
Uh, pretty much as expected. I, I said to, to Schwinn the day before because I think to get in the starting lineup, Özil would have had to uh, grab the the Barter game by the scruff of the neck and make himself undroppable. He'd have had to perform so well that it would have been a scandal to drop him, and he didn't do that. Um, obviously, Lacazette missed the game, um, so and Aubameyang played ninety. So I mean, it's it's understandable to play one of the two. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any surprises. It was good to see Jacker and Torreira pair together again in a four-two-three-one. I think people forget that this is how we won the vast majority of our games on the, that twenty-two unbeaten run with a back four and them two together. Um, so I don't I don't think there's any real big surprises when you look at what happened on Thursday. Mm, yeah, definitely. This is the um, formation I think we should be looking at. The only one I was shocked to see was Mkhitaryan. I, I, I thought he had a great game, but I just. It was odd to see him make another appearance. Well, I mean, that was probably the biggest criticism of people in and around the ground. Though, like, if there was, it wasn't a criticism, but the biggest question people ask are, oh, why is Mickey playing? But for me, he was our best player against Huddersfield. I'm pretty sure I gave him man the match on the show, and that was his first game back. And then Barté away, we was awful, but he was as good as or as bad as anyone else. Um, you couldn't pick him out. Mm. And then they're the only games we've played since he's been back. So if, and so if he's the best player in one and then on par with everyone else, he probably deserves to keep his place. Yeah, the, look, the only reason I, I, I it's just an odd for me, I, I just, you know, we, we bought uh, Dennis Suarez. And I thought he would have featured somewhere along the lines, but, you know, I'm, ha- I'm very happy with the result and I'm happy with the team performance. So I'm not, I'm not complaining, but I just thought, he was he was the big signing that we chased all all January. I, I thought he'd almost make it make it in the first team, if not soon, I suppose. Uh, I don't know why we signed him, to be honest. Yeah, I, I know that. We all know that. But I just, you know what I mean? Like we chased him and chased him, so you'd nearly expect Emery to go. Well, you're starting. It's the type of one of them seems to be an Emery. Emery seems to like him, so. Uh, Schwinn, you're pretty impressed with that lineup, mate. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say impressed, but it was pretty much as expected. Um, of course, I missed the bot take game because that's when I was in transit to get here, so I didn't realize that Obama Yang had played the the full ninety. But you know, I, I I expect him to start because I thought we would need all our available tools just because we haven't really been convincing. Of course, after the game, I was proven wrong. We we were good enough in the first half, particularly, to get the result. But I was expecting Aubameyang to to be in there. And you know, I mean, on Mkhitaryan, I think it's it's a strange one. I think you can quite clearly tell that Emery has his favorites. You know, Guendouzi is obviously one of them. It will be because uh, in all this, in the last few weeks, we've heard a lot of talk about why Mesut Ozil hasn't played, why he hasn't traveled, particularly in the last couple of weeks, because he's been fit. And Emery has come out and said that, you know, we want players to have trained for a while and at a, at a particular rate to be able to make a stamp for themselves and, and get in the team. But it seems like as soon as Mkhitaryan came back from injury, and this is not a slate on Mkhitaryan, it's just an observation, that as soon as he was back available, he's been back in the team. And to Tony's point, he's been decent. He's been one of the better players. But you can tell now, uh, you know, we've had enough months now to understand what Emery likes, who he likes. So his inclusion didn't surprise me, but it seems a bit hypocritical, if you guys know what I mean, just because you expect him to give players starting opportunities when they've had the time to train, etc. But he doesn't really stand by his word in that regard. And, you know, to someone like me, who's a big Mesut Ozil fan, it doesn't quite sit right, if you, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. No, I, I agree with you there. Um, yeah, who knows, mate, what's going on, to be honest. I, I don't think anybody knows. I'd be even surprised if he ever knows at times. Uh, Tony, it didn't take us long, mate. Six minutes, Lacazette gets a goal, assisted by Mkhitaryan. Yeah. Um, to be honest, we probably should have been 1-0 down at the time. Um, Leno made a good save from Redmond after, again, trying to play a ridiculously high line, and they got in. I think they got in twice in the first six minutes. One time they got the shot off and another time I'm not sure if someone got back and made a recovery tackle or fizzled out. I can't remember what happened. Um, but then, yeah, we got the goal. Um, nice move. Really nice move, actually. Um, I'm pretty sure they would have given a penalty. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain that he would have given a penalty and he let it go to see what was going to happen. Mickey fizzled ball across and it's a really good finish from Lacazette. And what's more pleasing for me, and he'd done it a lot more yesterday and I'll get onto it more later, he took up goal scorers positions yesterday 
as everyone knows, my biggest criticism of, his, of him has always been, I think he's a good footballer. He's a very good footballer. He doesn't get in goal scorers' positions, which is why he, for someone of his ability, I, I think it's poor that he, he's on eight or nine goals or whatever he's on, um, considering his ability. But now, or especially yesterday, a lot of times he took up them correct positions to score goals. Um, and for me, that was really pleasing to see. Yeah. Um, Schwinn, I'll let you talk through to the second goal or 17th minute uh, Mkhitaryan. Yeah, um, you know, Jack Stevens caught on the ball dwelling. You know, he had time to to pick his pass, but, you know, you don't want to give someone like Lacazette an invitation to come press you because, you know, he enjoys that. He relishes the physical side nowadays. And, you know, he, he put his goalkeeper in a bit of a pickle there because Angus Gunn was left stretching and, you know, in that case, any coach would tell you just kick it out, out, out into touch. But I think Gunn tried to find his teammate and the ball landed at Iwobi's feet. And to be fair to Mkhitaryan, it was a very, very good finish. And at that point, you, you're thinking that, OK, we, you know, we've got this in the bag and we'll probably go for a few more goals. And we tried, but it just didn't seem to come off um, in terms of end product. But for 16, 20 minutes in that regard, I think we're pretty good. We, as, as Tony mentioned, we were exposed a couple of times and... One time, I think Leno came to or to save us, and I think the other time it was Kolas and actually blocked an, a header from Armstrong. So we started a bit iffy, but you know, once we got that first goal and the second goal, of course, we we were, we were doing pretty well in the first half. I'd say, you know, even someone like Lichtsteiner, I thought had a, had a decent game yesterday and was willing to take players on. Uh, you know, you have to also take into account how poor Southampton were. You know, I, I thought they were very, very bad in the first half and. Despite playing a back five, they seemed all over the place, particularly in the back. So we were good, but I think it was also helped by the fact that Southampton were very poor in the in the opening stages of the first half. Yeah. Um, so obviously, yeah, two nil. You boys want to talk about a bit more of the game, but you know, in the match facts, there's, there's not obviously a lot more to go on. Uh, you know, some substitutions. Look, for for me, there's a bit of a worry that. We struggled to get that third goal. There was a lot of chances there, um, Tony, but it just we just struggled. I felt after that, you know, half time to come out in that second half. Yeah, I mean, look, there was a couple. Again, um, this isn't a criticism of Lacazette. He missed quite an easy chance once we were two 0 up. But again, I was just happy he was in the area. If he uh, is in in the right area, not the penalty area. If he keeps taking up them correct positions, he's going to get loads of goals. So. It's one of them he missed, but I'm happy that he was there. Yep. Um, and then there, there was a few other chances from other people. I mean, my my I've just watched it back, but my overriding feeling even at the game was, I'm going to be a massive hypocrite here. We got 2-0 up. We knew the game was done. I think they pretty much knew the game was done. And we stopped. And I'm usually okay with that, especially, as I said, when you've got so many games in so many days. But um, when we've been flat a lot of the time and there's there's a lot of criticism going around, it would be nice to to keep the crowd entertained, put your foot down, and get the fourth, fifth, or third, fourth, and fifth goals. But I feel like we didn't try really. We conserved our energy and and was professional. And as I said usually, and I've said this so many times on the on the podcast previously, I'm more than happy with that. I just think in the situation we're in, and they were there for the taking. I think we probably should have put our foot down, and um and, and gone for the throat, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, Schwinn, I, I won't you know, talk too much more about the match unless you've got something to say about substitutions. I just want to you know, bring out a couple of performances, um, some players, mate. Your thoughts on Awobi? He was all right. I thought he worked hard and uh, was, was positive in his, in his ball progression. He was carrying the ball a whole lot. He was obviously aided by the fact that Kolasinac had a very, very good game and he was always available. You know, I thought Kolasinac probably had one of his better games in an Arsenal shirt. And when you have that sort of support coming down your side, then you know that, that helps you as well. Uh, I mean, it is a characteristic of Iwobi to be a bit undecisive at times. So I think by law of averages, a lot of times you're able to create chances. You, you tend to forget how Iwobi maybe squandered a couple of opportunities. But that's all right. You know, you expect that from him at this point. He's not good enough, but I thought he had a decent game yesterday. Just quickly on the point that Tony made, you know, I think it's it's important for us to score goals as much as we can because I think goal difference come the end of the season might decide even the league winner's fate, you know, the way things are going. So I, I think that's something we should pay a bit more attention on. Um, I'm sure the manager hasn't asked us to 
you know, uh, put our foot on the brakes. But it's something that we, we maybe that needs to be addressed within the squad that we have to try and, and maximize as as much as we can. Of course, if you're two one down, then you maybe you want to be a bit more um, safe at that point and, and try to squeeze the result out. But it didn't ever look like Southampton were going to do any damage, other than maybe the, the opening stages of the second half. So you know, I, I'd expect us to be a bit more ruthless in the future. Yeah, no, you make a very good point there. Um, man of the match, Tony. Uh, Mickey. Mickey. Okay. Schwinn. Uh, a tough one. I mean, it's hard to argue with with that shout. I thought Granit had a very good game. As I said, I think Kolasinac had a very good game. Um, I also think Lacazette had a very good game, and it seems like he's definitely one that uh, the the Emirates faithful really, really like. I was telling you boys that I don't think I saw any any more shirts. I mean, it was pretty much Lacazette heavy in terms of uh, the fans that were at the Emirates and and the shirts I saw, which was a, a bit surprising to me. But you know, you could flip a coin between those three, four players, and I'd be all right with it. So you're not going to pick one. You're going to sit on the fence again. Yeah, why not? Different <laughs> location, same trend. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me, dude. He f- finds a fucking fence anywhere, this bloke. <laughs> I'll say, I'll, I'll say Granite. I thought he was well, he was brilliant. Wow. I, you know, I, I thought he was absolutely brilliant, mate. I, he moved everything forward. Um, I think he created the most chances in the game. Uh, key passes. Uh, he was just, uh, just... I just think... When Granite's not there, we aren't moving forward. I agree with you completely. Yeah, I thought he had a very good game, but again, I just watched it back and, I, and I'd forgotten about it. He just, you, there's always a, but he had a dickhead moment. And he, there yeah. was one he tried to play the ball across the face of our goal and it went straight toward Prowse, who probably should have scored. And we forget that because it didn't yeah, go in. But I just does, wish yeah. sometimes we'd have a game where you'd go, I thought Jacka played well. I'm not taking away from him, but I wish I could just say Jacka played well, not. Jacka played well, but he done that. You know what I mean? It's, mm. It feels like every week there's always a but with him. And and I mean, as a team, we have mistakes in us, especially when you look at you know players like Mustafi and and Lichtsteiner, Kolasinac, and you know we will often talked about how Granit tends to make mistakes, particularly because of the position he plays in, that that are very very expensive for us. So to Tony's point, if that had gone in, we'd probably be talking about that, but. You know, I, I think he's gained some of that that enigma back where the game slows down when he gets on the ball and he's able to find a good pass that puts the pressure off. I think we missed that for for the last couple of months and we were getting overridden in midfield. I saw some of that come back and I think that's part of the reason that we were able to control the game a lot more. So, I mean, I agree with you, Tez, but he's obviously got that brain fart in him. Yeah, I'll just, I come across an article today and I'll just read you thoughts because it shocked me look it was from from back in um a couple of months ago but I'll, he actually said uh he, he praises emery big time right so he says um arsenal midfielder granite shaker believes he is in his best form of the gunners career and his attributes that improvement to the arrival of the freak unite emery uh, he basically says it's the best i've felt at arsenal since i came to the club and the coach has had an enormous, enormous influence. Uh, he prepares us all and we have a plan. We know how to do it and the ball and without the ball. We know how and when to stand and where. Uh, and I thought, Jesus Christ, like, you don't often see this praise from players to about Emery. I don't know if you I think it's, seen it or not. But. I think it's very characteristic of the modern player. In fact, I was having a discussion with some chaps uh, up in the North Bank yesterday about how the modern footballer has to be coached to the inch. And, you know, I, I, we've spoken about this before on the podcast where someone like Dronit has been coached to the inch by Lucien Favre at, at Munchen Gladbach. Well, he and goes the on players, and says about he, he's exactly like him. He's a freak who pushes us back and forth ten times until everyone understands. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, characteristic of Emery in that case because we know he's he likes his players to be workmen and, and, and you know, put in 100% effort, for lack of a better term. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree with him when it comes to his best bout of form, to be perfectly honest. I think maybe, and this might be a bit cynical, but I think he might be pandering to the manager a bit just because, you know, we know uh, Emery likes him. He likes having him the team. He obviously is one of those players who 
rack up the most amount of minutes played in a season. And that was the case under Arson as well. So maybe there's a there's a bit of that going on there. Yeah, um, well, I'm not, I'm just going through Schwinn and he says, I'd never had contact with Emery until after the World Cup when I got back to training. The first thing he told me was, Granite, you're one of my five captains. Yeah, that doesn't mean a whole lot, though, does it? Because the other four captains have pretty much been, you know, their, their fates have been decided. But I don't know, what, what, what do you think, Tony? Do you think this is his best bout of form in an Arsenal shirt? Uh, no, not really. I think he's had two good games. And obviously this interview, I'm assuming, was before the game yesterday. So he's had a good game against Barté. Uh, the last few weeks, we haven't mentioned him as being good. Look, we all know I like him, but... It's not like the last few weeks we've gone, oh yeah, to Jack had a good game. I don't really think he's been playing. Um, I think this quote, and this is not me trying to take anything away from memory, I just think it's a, a trait in modern football and modern PR. The king is dead, long live the king. Whoever's here right now is is the greatest manager ever until they're sacked and then everyone will say they don't like them and, and the new guy's the best guy ever. I, I mean, I heard, again, I know we're going to get onto this, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I heard David Luiz came out praising Sarri yesterday. I can tell you ain't going to be doing it in six months. <laughs> that was a shit show, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that we've got a few questions on it, so I thought I'd avoid bringing it up as much as possible now. But yeah. again, I mean, that's modern football. You always hear whoever's in. He's not going to come out and go this man. I'm not saying he thinks this, but he's not going to go out and say, no, I'm not really playing too well because the manager's a pilot shite because that just guarantees you're not playing anymore. Well, he, go, he goes on and says... Um, uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm only quoting what, what Emery said. Uh, uh, Grenet, you're one of my my top five captains. You're also the best player at this club. Uh, Tez on the clock end talk podcast is right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you, you, you lost me and he's the best player at the club. <laughs> yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> okay, let's uh, dive into some questions. you want to talk any more about that game? You got any girls, Dad, on there? Um, and I'm, did I miss any, really? Uh, I was just going to quickly, I just pulled up who scored. Um, I thought you'd do it, but oh, okay. you hadn't. Uh, so I, I think this probably goes more to my point that Lacazette probably played a bit more like a, uh, a Yang yesterday in terms of being in the area and not being involved as much as he normally is. Uh, and he got an 8.6. They gave him man of the match, which I, I think he was good. I don't think he was man of the match. Um, Mickey got eight. Ramsey got 6.4, which I think is a disgrace. I thought he played quite well. Um, it will be seven. Uh, Jack a 7.3. Lichstein a 6.5. I thought he had one of his better games for us. Just um, what, what about Kolasinac? Sorry, Ted. Seven, yeah. uh, seven point six. So Kolasinac was off uh, best player. Oh no. So uh, so Lacazette eight point six. Mickey eight. Uh, Socrates seven point seven. Kolasinac and Mustafi seven point six. What about Leno? Right. I thought he had a good game too. Seven point five. Okay, that's good. Okay. Man, the match Lacazette. Oh, actually, and you've just reminded me, but and I forgot to pull it up. Um, Clockandtalk dot whatever we are blogspot dot com. Um, Craig did some ratings. So did Lacazette get man of match? I am not sure. I'm just about to have. I didn't, know. I didn't get a notification. <laughs> Usually I get a notification to retweet it. Maybe you done it before I saw it. Yeah, so I, I, I retweeted it this morning. So I just I know this is great listening, uh, but I forgot. So Clockandtalk dot blogspot dot com. Craig had put his ratings up this morning on my time. Now he had he give he gives Emery a rating every match, so he's give Emery a seven point five, and okay. he's give Leno and Mikatarian and Granite joint man of the match. Leno eight point five, Granite eight point five, and Mikatarian eight point five. What do you give Laka? Uh, eight. Okay. And he gave... What was his lowest? Oh, Lickstein, a 6.5. What did Lickstein get on your ratings on the who scored? 6.5. Yeah, okay. There you go. Yep, no arguments there. Sorry, I was just reading it. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, we'll get into some questions then. So we might oh. do something a little bit different. Oh, sorry, Tony, were you going to say something? No. Nope. So we'll do something a little bit different. Instead of me asking all the questions, Schwinn come up with this brainstorming idea the other week. 
that we do like a bit of a round the table uh, question, Schwinn. Is that correct? Yeah, I thought it's it's best to get everyone involved, and you know, there's a lot of questions that come come our way that that Tez obviously uh, speaks about off off air, and you know, it leads to good conversation. So we thought we'll just put that on air and let let everybody get a slice of of what's coming. So I'll get the ball rolling on this one, and I'll throw this question to you, Tez. Um, this is from M Double A Gunner. A regular, of course, um, mm-hmm. and obviously someone who's popping in my mentions every time with, with some snarky comment. Um, he says, why can we never beat two top six teams back to back? I just don't think we're good enough. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, as, as we've said on the podcast, I've, we've, we've type of rated us as, as a fourth place team, fifth place team. Uh, uh, you know, if you're talking the top six, like we're, we're down the the lower of that top six team. So, Man City, Liverpool, are we going to beat them back to back? Nah. Chelsea, Man, Man United, I'd be thinking we'd be doing well to beat them back to back. I just don't think we're a good enough team at the moment. I think we've got a lot of work to needs to be done. It's hard to disagree with that, to be fair. Um, okay, I'll go with one. Uh, Tony. Do you think Spurs can be dragged into the top four race? They have Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea away. Yeah, we was, ha- we was having this conversation on Saturday. We were watching the, the Tottenham-Burnley game, but we were looking ahead to the Tottenham-Chelsea game on Wednesday. And I was saying, I, I don't know what result I want because I think Tottenham are now seven points ahead of us. I may be wrong. Um, but then they've got Chelsea. And if Chelsea win, they're kind of hanging on to our tails. But then we get closer to Tottenham if we win. If Tottenham win it, I think it could almost put Chelsea out of the running for top four or very close to. So I was saying I don't know what I want with that because, as I said, if Tottenham are now seven ahead, they lose to Chelsea, they lose to Liverpool, then and we beat them, which are their next three games, that puts us ahead of them. So, yeah, they could conceivably get dragged into the top four, but uh, top four battle, sorry. Mm. But... Um, if they do, it makes it very, very open because it means Chelsea will still be in it. Um, and then obviously in Liverpool, Man City are kind of irrespective for the race of the top four. Um, but it's an interesting one. I, I mean, I've got a question back to our listeners. Who do you want to win on Wednesday, Tottenham or Chelsea? Mm-hmm. Well, just to you two as well. I think, I think I'd think i take Chelsea because I think they're in... If Tottenham get a bit of a run on... Chelsea are in a bit poorer form, so I'm thinking they get, they might they might be a chance to drop one later. I, I can't even remember who they play now in the run home, but you know what I mean. They might be in a chance to drop one of them games that possibly uh, Tottenham might not drop. But then fucking Tottenham are good chokers, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So I just looked. It is seven point. We are seven points behind them. Um, as I said, by by Wednesday night, if we win and they lose, that will be free. No, oh, I'd, I'd be happy with a draw. We played them Saturday. I'd have, be happy with a draw. I suppose one each. Yeah, I guess that's the the sitting on the fence answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Swin. Yeah, I mean, for me, it'd be a draw too. Just because, I mean, I agree with you, Taz, in the sense that Chelsea might drop points in the future. And it's hard to disagree with Tony as well that a loss at this point could could put Chelsea really in a in a tough situation. I just think that with our quality, uh, it's best if two positions in the top four are open for and up for grabs. You know, with if, if Tottenham get a positive result and are able to you know, sort of solidify their position as as third in the ladder, um, I think that one spot that remains between the three teams. It's going to be a tougher challenge. Maybe it'll give the players a bit more positivity and some room to play with. So I'd, I'd probably be rooting for a, a draw as well. I think, Tony, on that little thing that I you, you put out last week, you know, where teams are going to come and whatnot. So I think I put Tottenham, so obviously Chelsea, Tottenham, I think I put a draw there. But on the flip side, I, so Chelsea have uh, Wolfhampton in two weeks, three weeks, two weeks, and... That's a tough game, I think, for them because Wolves are at home. Uh, um, yeah. No, they're not. No, they're not. Oh, Chelsea's at home. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So still, yeah, I think Chelsea's that's still a tough fixture. It's not an easy one. The Wolves have picked up points against 
most Every, top six yeah. sides, yeah. But then you've got, and then I'm looking down at their games, you know, they've got Everton, Liverpool, Man United, and you could throw Burnley and Watford if you, you know, if you think they're a tough, tough game, but... I think they have Palace as well, which is obviously a, a tricky fixture. Uh, no, no. No, okay. That might be... Oh, I think that's United then next week, yeah. or maybe this Wednesday. Yeah, so, yeah, they, 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 you know, I think there are possibility of dropping some points later, I, especially Man U, Liverpool. But then again, they levelled with um, City, but I didn't, I didn't see the game, but... Was there strong lineups or not? Yeah, by full strength. Yeah, okay. There you go. <sighs> Sarri might have patched some holes. Okay, Tony, you want to ask Schwinn the next question or you want me to? Yeah, give me two seconds. Just, uh, yeah, so from Vish, um, are the rumours that we are favourites to sign Aaron Wambisaka true? Well, I obviously have no background information on this, um, but I wouldn't believe them personally. I think the the price tag is something that obviously dissuades me. And I also don't think that's the profile of player we'll be looking at, considering we have Hector Bellerin and Emery clearly favors Hector Bellerin. And, and to be fair, we are better with Bellerin in, in the team, you know, despite taking shots at him every now and then. No one can deny that he is better. Uh, well, we are better with him in the team. So I think the, the figure that's been touted is 40 million. And, you know, we've spoken about a grade, B grade, C grade priorities, and this doesn't feature an A or B for me. So I wouldn't personally believe them. Okay. You boys want to add anything on that? I got nothing. I got no idea. Um, to be honest, I've not even seen the rumors, so I've not been on Twitter much because you've been preoccupied most of my time. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's 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 a good enough reason. Um, I'll throw the next question to you, Tez, and this is from Hakon. Uh, and in fact, Sri Vigunar asked the same question. Um, thoughts on Monchi regarding the latest links? Uh, yeah, for me, this is a tough one because obviously, you boys know, I also, I, you know, I'm, Rome is close to my heart as well. Um, however, Monchi, mate, there's, there's only one word to describe the bloke. He, he is a genius. Um, he's the most respected sporting director in world football, I reckon. And the amount of players that he's bought and fixed, you know, teams like he, he come into Sevilla and they, what, they win three Europa Leagues in a row under Amory. So there's obviously a great combination between them two. Um, he's, he's been to Roma for two years now. He's bought in uh, under. And I don't know if you could say that he bought in uh, Kluvert, but cause for me, Kluvert, was, he was already pinned as a, a target for somewhere um, there was teams chasing him at the time so but he, he chose Roma as well but um, but Monchi mate, he's, he's just a fucking genius do I want him an Arsenal? Absolutely yes um, I think he I think give him two seasons as Arsenal and we're back in the race boys uh, at the moment there's no plan for me at Arsenal there's no moving forward um, Zven was He's leaving, what, next month or this month, is it? Um, he's gone already, right? Oh, he, well, yeah, seven, oh, he went, OK. So he's gone. So oh, I think to myself, well, who's going who's gonna to take, you know, take it up? Monchi, the only thing I think with Monchi, he'll want to bring his, in, his own team in. So I don't know how that'll sit with Arsenal. Tony, you might be able to add on to that. He'll want to bring his own scouting team in. Um, whether Arsenal will let him do that, I don't know. Because, you know, he works... It's a very simple process, what Monchi does. He, he finds players cheap and he turns them over for profit. Uh, it's, it's very simple. But the amount of work him and his scouting team put in, like, they will watch... And I've, I've watched documentaries and, and read articles on, on how they all work. And they will actually watch... Like, the amount of football they go and watch and travel around the world is is unbelievable, and they know like I can't think of a team at the moment. Well, under he, he come from some the Turkish league. I can't even think of the team where he come from. But like on the hope that a man man Manchester City or somebody they're not going to do that. So 
that's where what I what I like about him is he will find the, these hidden gems or hidden talents. And look, I'm happy for him to come to Arsenal for a year or two, and then we sell him on for a profit because I think that's as we all know we're a, we're a club who's self you know, self sustaining model, aren't we? So we, we tend to need a bit of a plan going forward. And I think Monchi's the bloke. Um, will I miss him at Roma? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely miss him. But for me, he's a genius and. He's fixed Roma. He's got him on the right track. Um, I'm, I'm hoping he'll do the same at Arsenal. Your thoughts? Too? Before, oh, yeah, before you answer that, Tony, another thing to to think about is both Shri and Hakon are sort of alluded to. If there's any concerns or any potential cons to getting Monchi in, so maybe that's something you can you can talk about as well. Yeah, Tony's me. Sorry. Yeah, you there, mate? Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you what Schwinn just asked, if there's any negatives, because you've probably looked at us, looked at him, sorry, much closer than, than we have. So I, I was literally just going to ask what, what um, Schwinn just asked. Negatives in, in, in his approach or...? Just any anything. Like, obviously, we hear all the time about the positives that come with him. What is there any is there any downsides? Look, there is a couple of negatives. Um and it's and it's the you know it's always a gamble, isn't it? Like uh, you know, are these are some of these players? And I'm trying to think like of some players that who haven't been um, that, who have been a Monchi signing, um, but haven't he hasn't made a turnover. So there's always going to be a negative. Like there's always going to be a, a gamble when when you've got scouts going out to the world looking for unknown players and hoping that they'll come back and make it in the Premier League too. That For me, that is a, one of the biggest gambles. You're hoping these players will make it in the Premier League. Um, obviously, they've made it in Spain. He, the players he's bought in, he, they've made it in Italy. Some of these players he's bought in, but, you know, does an under come in from Turkish and, and, and start for the Arsenal? So that, that for me, is the big, big negative. Fair enough. Um, I'm trying to think of, of any other negatives, but other than that, I, I I do. For me, I see it as a plan. I see it as moving forward, but and I'm willing to take the odd negative to for him to bring out the positives. So his record speaks for itself. So it's very hard to argue that he's not going to bring something. I mean, I guess I guess a couple of questions come to my mind because I know very little about Manchi. So, I mean, I guess the first question would be, what is he like in terms of working in a team? Because, you know, we know that Sven left out, of course, because of, you know, tensions with San Leahy and Emery. And yes, both Emery and San Leahy know uh, Manchi very well. So there could be some harmony there. But one thing that seems certain with Manchi is that he tries to buy players, which are maybe, let's say, between 15, 20, 30 million and then sell them at a higher price. Now, I don't know how many of those signings we can make. So uh, how good is he when he's pushed against the wall? And has he been successful in, in getting players maybe, you know, in the in the price range between 5 to 15 million and, and then turn them into in, in bigger players? Those are the two things that I'm not quite sure on. Yeah, look, he'll he'll bring out. Sorry, I was just load, <laughs> stopped loading something up, and bloody speaker blew me head off. Um, the, uh, look, he he can get players cheap, and he got this. He got under cheap. Kluvert, I, I think he, I don't think he was that cheap, um, off the top of my head. But he can get. He, he, yeah, I think I think Roma paid thirty for him, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I but think euros, it's so about thirty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so like, it, look, it's always a gamble for me. It, it is always a gamble. Can he can he go and find a Guendouzi for seven or eight million? I suppose is what everybody's wanting to know. And I think yes, he can. I think I think yes, he can. He he, he can do that. For me, he's look. And people talk about Zvan. Um, you know, he's he's brilliant and whatnot, but. For me, Monchi is brilliant. You can only you only got to look what he done at Sevilla. You look at now what he's doing at Roma, and and I think well, there's a plan moving forward. Um, yeah. 
I think one thing that, that that worries me, and I mean, feel free to correct me on this, but I think you know Tony made a very good point a few weeks ago about Sven that he he didn't really necessarily go for the hidden gems. He was someone who was hunting for value, and I think if anything, Monchi is that on steroids. You know, the, the signings of someone like Pastore, for example. You know, those are again value signings, and of course, he's he's been a big flop at Roma, but. That that's something again that worries me. What are we just bringing him in? Which I mean, in the short term, seems like the right thing to to bring in some players who who we can turn over for a profit within the next two years, and then after two years, use that money to build a squad. Now, as a self-sustaining club, it's understandable, but that does mean that for the next two years, we might be in for a bit of pain. And I can understand the need for it, but it's not going to be easy to go through those two years, and that's something I fear about. Well, well, look, he, he brought in Danny Alves. Now, I've, I've just brought it up up on the website. So he brought in Danny Alves for about 400,000 euros. He sold him to Barcelona for 26 million. Um, was, he, was he at Sevilla for that long? I didn't realise he was there long enough to buy Danny Alves. Danny Alves was there about... 2000, 2002 and I sold him 2008 to Barcelona yeah I didn't re- well I didn't realise that Monchi was there since that long I thought he came in shortly before that Europa League wins one of his biggest criticism he's getting out of Roma is and, and for me it was I, I, I'm still I'm a little bit like you on the fence Mo Salah was that a good good idea to sell Mo Salah to Liverpool for what we sold him for or could we have held on to him for one more season and then got your 100, 100 million for him that's probably the one mm-hmm. criticism player that he's, he's getting at the moment did we sell Mo Salah for too cheap I don't you see that's, that's a big point in the con list I'd say because sometimes when you're trying to generate that, that quick revenue you know you I mean look again it's a gamble right but it's it, it it's a big one that they lost out on, I'd say. Mm, mm, mm. Um, Ra- uh, Ivan Rak- Rakitic, so he got in for 1.8 and sold him for about 13. Uh, mm. So, you know, he, he, he's, and he's good at what he does. There's no doubt about it. He's like lots of players. Um, I didn't know he bought Carlos Backer. There you go. Bought him for 5 million, sold him, sold him for 22 million to Milan. So you know, like, uh, but that that was that's the, probably the one, one that um, was the talk of uh, for Roma fans was Mo Salah was the one. Uh, he also got rid of Nain Golan as well. I mean, I think he got a great fee for Nain Golan because Nain Golan's played not real good since, since he did leave Roma. So he's he's on a bit of a down form. So he he sold him at the right time. Mo Salah probably thought he was going to sell him at the right time, but he's kicked on in the Premier League. And what did he get last year? The Golden Boot. And pl- what did he get? The Player of the Year last year too, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you know. So that was that. So you know, one out of probably ten ten players. Well, you you probably forgive that, don't you? Yeah, I'd take those odds. Um, but just looking, so his total spend, and I'm not sure how old this article is either. But so this is on this article. So his total spend was about 29 million. He total receives 177 million for his players, with a profit of 148 million. Not bad. Mm. In that time, I guess that that's what it boils down to. In that time, how much have Roma won though? Because well, mate, it's all well and good. We're, we're the best ter- best Italian team in in Europe. Yes, at, yeah, at the moment, yeah, you could make that argument. Well, we we, we made the Champions League. Uh, we were the the high, the last year. Uh, we made the top four of the Champions League. And domestically, have you guys won cups? Uh, no, I know the league included no, no, you guys. No, no, no one cares about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but what what I suppose look, what I probably should say is is we're consistently been in the top four. Um, this year we're we'll, we're we're gunning for the top four. I think we're on about forty five points, sitting in fifth. Uh, you Uve's run away with it. They're about twelve or thirteen points in front, so they'll they'll win it, obviously. Last year we got second, I think, 
and the league, and we made the top four of the um, Champions League. And the year before, we were in top four. Uh, you know, we're consistently making top four, and and then Champions League was we went through to obviously the top four last year uh, with that big win yeah, over Barcelona. I think, I think as well, league positions are, are kind of irrelevant, or even cop competition are kind of irrelevant with Monchi's role. He brings the players in; it doesn't mean the manager is going to do the right things with them. Um, it's true. So I don't, yeah, I don't mm-hmm. think you can really judge him. They okay, they got top four or they got to the semi because. The next season, they could have had a shitter, and it's not because the players have changed, just maybe because the managers they've fallen out with the manager or, or whatever. So I think you can kind of just have to judge on the player improvement because it's not his job to manage the players; it's his job to get the right players. If the if the manager can't do a job with them, then there's not really someone like a Monchi or a Sven or whatever, whoever can do with it. Uh, look, he gets a big rap for working with Emery, so obviously, I'll, look, them two have got a great chemistry together. And I'd imagine Emery's maybe a bit of pull at Arsenal and saying we want, we need Monchi, we want Monchi, um, because I, I think you know them two work together well. Tony, you probably know more about Sevilla than me and Schwinn, but was it three Europa leagues in a row under them two? It was definitely three. Uh, was it in a row? I'm not 100. percent I'm not sure if it was 100. Uh, I'm not sure if it was three in a row. It was definitely three though. Yeah, because they beat Liverpool in the final, didn't they? Yeah, they were one down. Out or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, he did. He does get a lot of praise for that. That you know, and then everywhere you see yeah, Monchi, you only got to that. That's the first thing that usually pops up. So they've got a good working relationship. So for me, that's a that's a pro. Um, I look. He's going to come in. If he comes in, expect a couple of big name signings to be sold, because he'll use that them big name signings to generate some income. And the first thing he did at Roma was he sold Nain Golan, he sold Mo Salah, and I think he sold Strutman. What was that this year? Allison as well. Oh well, that was that, next that season, was wasn't this, it? That was the next season. But I'm talking the first yeah. season. So um, he'll do it straight I away. Thought, wasn't I thought Nangalan was this summer? Uh, Nangalan was. No, I'm pretty sure he went. He was the first one to go. Oh no, he went this summer too. Sorry, he did. Yeah, of yeah, so. Right. so it was yeah. just Salah first so year. It was maybe just some Salah other first year and a couple of little. Alisson and Angolan this year. Yeah, yeah. So, so he'll he'll sell somebody big to generate some money to use in the transfer market. Now, who's that big player at Arsenal though? Who's going to generate your 30, 30 million? You never, you never know because the the budgets in Italy aren't as big because the TV deals aren't as big and stuff. So he may potentially have just enough money anyway yeah he might yeah yeah but that's what he'll look i'd imagine that's that'll be his first thing he'll look at what what budget he's got and whether he wants to sell a big name player and that'll probably rattle a couple of arsenal fans because i can tell you as roma fans we were a bit shocked when we saw mo Salah walking out the door oh sorry he sold um that midfielder to event uvo panic panic yeah he sold him the first season, first summer as well. So, um, yeah. So I don't know. Don't know. It'll piss a couple of Arsenal fans off if you see an Urza walk out the door or a or a or a Granite Shacker. I'll be like, what the fuck? Like, but it'll be a plan because he'll need to generate some money. But as you said, Tony, being England, he might not. He might already have fifty million, and if he's got that, well, then he's. He'll do something with it. That's my thoughts, anyway. There you go. Hmm. Probably. Um, okay, what are we up to? Uh, that I see, fella. Um, that's not a question. No, so, okay, Vish says, uh, Schwinn, since we are in a state where funds are limited, which of the bottom three players... Would you consider as recruits for Arsenal? Just, just sorry, he means bottom three teams. Oh, sorry, bottom three teams. Oh no, you're right. You read it right. It's just he worded it wrong. Oh, okay. Uh, personally, I'd love who? Hoiberg. Hoiberg. I'll let you read yeah. these these out, Tony. <laughs> uh, Hoiberg, 
Bednarek and Ward Prowse from Southampton and Diakabi from Huddersfield and Fosu Mensa from Fulham. Who would you take? Look, I mean, there's certain players among those three teams that, that I like, but I mean, can they do a job for the Arsenal even coming off the bench? I don't know. I mean, look, we know funds are going to be limited, but I don't think they'll be that limited that we'll be hunting, you know, in, in that part of the the league or e- even necessarily in, in this league. You know, we'd probably be trying our odds somewhere else. With all due respect to these three teams, I no one comes to mind that I'd, I'd take a chance on, to be honest. I was just thinking that... Prayers, he does all right, but nah. nah, I'm with you, I think. Prayers. Yeah, I don't. I mean, obviously, we spoke about the Akabi a couple of weeks ago, and based on the about 95 minutes of football I've seen him play, I've been impressed, but that's not enough to, to warrant say, saying I was interested in signing him. Uh, I don't think there's anyone really from Southampton I'd look at. Potentially, maybe a backup keeper. Because McCarthy and uh, Gunn are, are pretty decent, and they'd probably be happy being number two. Um, again, if we're looking down the list of problems in the summer, we're going to need a keeper, but we're not really going to want to spend because it will be a second choice. Um, but that's probably about it. Um, I would. Is Fossey Mensa still at Man United, or have they actually sold him? I know he's on. He's at Fulham, but I mean, is he on loan? I think sold? he's on loan, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I thought so as well. But I mean, I don't particularly rate him anyway. I wouldn't be looking anywhere near him. Um, I mean, the obvious one people would say I don't rate him, but everyone rates Sessegnon, so he's probably the obvious one. But it seems like there'd be a long queue for his signature. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, this is from Vish and this is actually a question that I've been thinking about as well so Tony Swin sorry can I just ask Tony something on the um, on that he mentioned the keeper as what's I noticed Stoke have fallen right down in the championships at the moment I think they're on about 10th or 12th last time I looked Um, Butland is he do you think he'd be an option for Arsenal because well if you're they're not coming back up this year no. So, I wonder how long he's got to go on his contract and if Arsenal are thinking, oh, well, you know, you guys probably need the money to even get yourself back in the Premier League. Well, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's all on the fee. Um, I, I don't know what they'd be looking at. I know they were looking at £30 million in the summer and obviously no one paid it. Uh, they probably won't be desperate for money, I'd imagine, because they're getting parachute payments still. Mm. Um but yeah, I don't know. It'd be all in the fee again. He's probably whoever it is, unless well, whoever we sign is probably going to come in as a second choice keeper. So I can't see us spending more than ten, fifteen million absolute max. And I don't think you'd get him for that. And I also don't think because of his age and stuff, he'd want to be a number two. I think I just after saying that, I was thinking the Fulham keeper Sergio Rico is not bad. Um, I think worked under Emery before, if I'm not mistaken. But again, would he want to be a number two? I don't know. Who else went down last year that's not looking real good that pinched something out of there? Uh, Norwich? I mean, I, don't, I, I wouldn't be looking at players that have spent a year in a championship, to be honest. Oh, you wouldn't? Okay. No, especially because they've, they've got relegated for a reason and then they've spent a year playing at a lower level of football. I mean, I, I couldn't even tell. The last time Arsenal signed a championship player, I couldn't tell you. And when we have, it's... It was holding, wasn't it? Well, that's what I was going to say. It's been youngsters. Yeah. Or like change. Oh no, Southampton had come up, I think, by the time he signed Chambers. But yeah, it was players that had played less than 40, 50 games. They're under 20 years old. We, I can't, couldn't tell you last time we signed a fully championship player. Yeah, 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 okay. Sorry, Shun. No worries. Uh, Tony, why hasn't Mabropanos been given a look in as yet? And what was your assessment on Mustafi at right back? This is from Bish. Um, <clears throat> I feel like for whatever reason, Emery doesn't really fancy Mavropanos. We've only seen him at City for like 10 minutes because of injuries. Um, obviously, didn't put him in the Europa League squad. He's been back fit. I know he obviously was injured at the start of the season, but he's been back fit for, I think, a couple of months now, or at least at least six weeks. And, and we've just not seen anything of him. Obviously, again, you, you, you try and give these players minutes in the Europa League by not putting him in the squad. It seems like he's essentially saying you're not going to play this season unless something drastic happens. Um, or like how he came in last season, if we get to a point where we end up sacking off the league in favour of the Europa League, he might get minutes there. 
Um, hopefully it doesn't come to that. But it just feels like, and I don't know this, it feels like Emery doesn't really fancy him. I was, I was surprised uh, and, we didn't see him get loaned out in January, to be honest. Or yeah. Was he injured still? I think he was back by then. It's, it's, it's hard to tell when someone doesn't play, but he played a few under-23s and whatnot. In terms of Mustafi, uh, he wasn't really tested, to be honest. Uh, I think it would be unfair to give an assessment, either positive or negative. He overhit one cross. He made a good tackle that was given as a foul, and that's about it. It's just nothing to write home about because nothing happened. Okay, am I asking you one now, Schwinn, or Tony asking Schwinn one? You go, Tony. Yeah, one second, sorry. Um, from Vish again. The sexy football was a joy to watch yesterday. Ramsey and Iwobi with some beautiful football in certain spells. What do you attribute this performance to? It was missing against Huddersfield and against Barty in the first leg. That was the end of his question. I would say it's been missing for a hell of a lot longer than that. Yeah, I tend to agree. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, the team's very moody. And, you know, it, we, we've often complained about how a, a specific sp- squad put out there has has performed better than, than we've seen on that day. So it's very hard to say uh, what exactly it is. And I'm sure it's it's a question that bothers the manager as well. What I like to think of it is that it was the Schwinn effect. Turning up at the Emirates, the boys knew that they had to put a shift in so that a traveling fan from abroad is going to have fun. And thanks for obliging, boys. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say, add to that, though, Schwinn, because I don't know if we've talked about Ramsey much or if we haven't recorded since he announced he is leaving to go to Juve next year. I Hats off to him. I, he, he come out yesterday and... Look, he, he still put 100% effort in, you know, and some players you, you've seen over the years that they know they're going elsewhere and they, they, their heart's not in it. But, I, I you know, Ramsey's heart, he's, he's in it and he's, I get the funny feeling he'll be, he'll be putting 110% in right at the end of the season. So hats off to him. Absolutely. I mean, he's a, he's a thorough professional and, you know, he, he's been through so much at the club that, that has emboldened him to the fans but it's also emboldened the club to him you know it's it's a two-way street that that relationship so i i, I wouldn't expect anything else from him because that, that's just how ramsey is and as tony mentioned at the top of the show he was very good yesterday you know we, we were talking about this in the pub that i think he's one of the top five midfielders in in the country in, in, the, in the world i'd say and and tony made a very good point that in, in terms of what he does, there's probably none better. So, you know, good luck to him, of course, at UA. And I think despite the, the astronomical wages that have been quoted, I think he, he probably deserves it. I think he's earned that move, if you ask me. Yeah, absolutely. I laughed at the All right, wages, next. Co- <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, Tez, I'll throw this to you. This is from Sandeep. Easier way to Champions League, League or Europa League? <laughs> I'm a gambling man, but I'm not willing to take that gamble on only Europa League. I, I would like to see us throw everything at the Premier League. I, th- I think we can make top four. Looking at, uh, well, definitely fourth. I'm looking at the other fixtures and the other teams' fixtures. I like them chances better than getting to the last game of a Europa League final and losing it to a Chelsea or something, or going to a penalties or something. You know, long like what happened with Chelsea today so for me I throw everything at the Premier League Tony I'm going to remain consistent with what I've said all along and what I said last season get to a point where you have a real 50-50 fixture in Europa League and reassess them I don't think we can provide an answer at this time because you never know you could get Ren Krasnodar and then you're in the semi and you could get someone who are not a, an A-list team a Valencia and before you know it, you're one game away. And, and that's entirely possible. I mean, look at when United won the Europa League a few years ago. Their route, I mean, they, they didn't play anyone. So I don't think at this time it's easy to, you can, can really say, because if we get a run like that, then of course I'm going to say Europa League. But we don't know. So I think you just have to keep going, keep winning, and get to a point where you're in a tie and you're not really sure if you're going to win and you have to go full 100% balls out. And then you look where you are in the league and you can judge between the two. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. Yeah. That's, All right, well, next that's question, biggest, Taz. That's my biggest problem, Tony, is there's still a lot of good teams in it. <laughs> like, we're not, you know, you still got Chelsea, you got, I think, Napoli, we've also got uh, Valencia, Sevilla. They, yeah, that's the yeah. limit. So, you know, that's, that's a big fucking gamble. Like, you come up against a Sevilla in, a, in, in the semis, and it's like, well, boys. Hold on to your nuts because this is a make or break if we're in the Champions League because we've just thrown the Premier League. So, yeah, you know I mean, as I said last season, we sacked off the league, but we was in, I think, sixth at the time. And even though top four was still mathematically possible, it was never really going to happen. So at that time, you have to sack off the league, and it made sense. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I mean. You have to reassess. If we get to the time we are playing a really hard team in Napoli or, or, or a Chelsea, but we're still in the top four race, then you have to go on all fronts. You can't sack either one off. Uh, I mean, again, when United won it, they completely sacked the league off. They, they were in a similar position to what we was in last year, where they knew they couldn't get top four, so they basically played fucking anyone. I think Mourinho almost played himself at one point. <laughs> but I think I like our run home in the Premier League more than I like to run home if we come to the Europa League, but then knowing that that Europa League could change, if that makes sense, like... Yeah, but again, as I said, you've got to reassess when we get there because you say you like our run. We've only got two league games in March, Tottenham and, and United, and then we could be in the the next. If we beat Wren, we'll know we will know who our next round opponents are. We could be six yeah. to eight points off top four, um, and and have an easier game in the Europa League or a really hard game in Europa League. So mm. I think you just completely have to reassess as and when it comes. As I don't think you can on. answer that now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, is it me to ask Tony one, is it? Okay, Sandeep. It was a granite masterclass, but our defence performances on paper looked better. Although we could have conceded twice, Leno made some great saves but worried me a lot when he had the ball on his feet. He was delaying, clearing, passing the ball. Could have been inception, Tony, an inception. Controversial statement, and we're going to get a lot of replies about this. Leno is shit with his feet. He's confident. The kicks never fucking go where they're meant to. He cannot... His accuracy is terrible. I, he's a better shot stopper than I thought he was going to be, but for me, he's worse, with, he's worse with his feet than I expected. He's just confident. Like So he'll take the ball, and it's good to have that option, a keeper that doesn't mind taking the ball, because it means you're playing with 11 men rather than 10 if you're scared to go back to a keeper like Czech. But his actual kicking is not very good at all, and I think it's something that needs to be worked on. Um, in terms of our overall defensive performance, we started high again for some reason. Uh, they got in twice, we dropped, and then there wasn't any problems after that, pretty much. Um, but I don't know why we, we started high again, especially when it was so clear what they were trying to do. Playing wet Redmond through the middle, you're only doing that for one reason. I mean, they've got, they had Austin, I think, on the bench, and, and Long, I think, I'm not sure if he was on the bench. I know he'd had a little niggling injury, so I'm not sure if he even made the bench. But when you're playing your quickest player, who's a natural dribbler through the middle where you don't really get to dribble, you're only doing that to try and get him behind. So I thought us starting high was lunacy, but they worked it out pretty quickly. Um, a few months ago, it would have taken us to go 2-0 down to figure it out. So I guess that's a positive. But yeah, once we defend, we dropped deep, I thought defensively we were pretty solid. Let's throw one at Schwinn here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how good was Iwobi in the last two games? He benefits from having someone like Ozil and Ramsey around him. There's less pressure on him to create everything. Uh, that was Sandeep again. Yeah, I mean, I, of course, didn't watch the the second leg of, uh, of Bate, but by all accounts, he was decent that day. And uh, so was he yesterday. You know, we, we've said this on the podcast many times before that He's probably good enough to come off the bench as a second attacking option or you know as as a creative option, but to to burden him week in week out as the chief creator in the absence of Mesut Ozil, Aaron Ramsey, and as was the case for the past few weeks, Mkhitaryan, uh, he just wasn't able to to operate at that level. I think as as someone coming off the bench, he he can be a bit more impactful, and that takes the spotlight away from him. So he, he seems to have done well in the last couple of games, uh, starting and, and, and racking some um, playing time. But week in, week out, I still wouldn't put all our eggs in that basket. And then I hope that in the summer we, 
we make enough moves that that you know push him a bit more and and force him to fight for a spot in the team because at the moment he's just walking into the starting 11 and I'm pretty sure all Arsenal fans would agree that that's not the best way to proceed. That's just me, though. I mean, people could disagree, but I don't. I don't want to put all, all, you know. I don't want to put that as a gamble. I don't think that's good enough. Hard to disagree with you there, mate. I just want to touch before you ask me questions, Schwinn. I just want to put uh, touch because Vish asked about some Southampton players and bottom three teams or something up earlier. Tony Redmond, would he be somebody you'd look at? For as a Welbeck replacement? Uh, not as a Welbeck replacement, though. No. Um, because he's got some I, I like Redmond, but... Yeah, but Danny's... Danny's strength is his mixture of everything. He's very strong, he's very tall, he can jump like a flea. I'm assuming fleas can jump high. <laughs> um, he's quick, he's powerful. As I said, his best, his probably worst asset is his technical ability, and you'd probably say his end product, he doesn't return, get the, the returns in terms of goals and assists that you'd expect him to... Whereas Redmond doesn't get the returns and goals and assists you're expecting to, and he's a he's a dribbler. He's technically better than Welbeck, I would say, in terms of footballing. But he doesn't offer you that that different option. As in the the joy of Danny is you could bring him off for an Aubameyang, say, and instead of now just having pace, you'd have pace, power, strength. As I said, the the jump that you could go aerial. Um, I I think we're really going to struggle to replace Danny, to be honest. Yeah, okay. No, just when you mentioned his name, it just got me thinking. I thought, hang on, he's might be might be a good replacement for a well bit. But yeah, okay. Yeah, the next question, sorry, before Schwinn asks it, because it's directly for Schwinn, so I'll just ask it to him. Yep. Um, is the Bombay Bieber going on Arsenal fan TV? <laughs> <laughs> we would love to see him on there with Tony. Again, that was Sandy. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, I, I am probably not the the biggest critic of Arsenal fan TV, certainly not on this podcast. But I'll tell you what: if Tony chooses to to wind up on there, you bet your ass I'll do as well. But you guys got to convince Tony, not me. Not I'll choice. leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I just look. I don't really have particularly much against the channel, but standing outside the ground when it's usually cold for forty five minutes, waiting for someone to speak to you for two minutes. Like there's pubs there. Go to the pub, have a drink, see your mates. If you, if you really want to voice your opinion, tell your mates. Like, and again, I don't even blame the big guys on there, the ones that get the views, because as far as I know, they just walk up and they get their views done straight away and then they leave. So you can't. I'm not. This isn't even labelled at the people that everyone's going to go. Like probably at DTR, these guys said you're an idiot wasting your time because he probably doesn't. I don't know. But I ain't standing around for 45 minutes to tell someone, oh, I think we played well. No, I'll just tell you a lot the next day on the podcast. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll go to the pub. Right. <laughs> so the answer to that, Sandeep, is no. I, just between me and you, though, Sandeep, I reckon Schwinn's fucking hanging to get there, mate. Well, he oh, was a bit on. late. Yes, he did. He did, was late to meet me yesterday. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> mate, he, to be fair, he would be hanging to meet Robbie, his idol. I can guarantee you, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> to be fair, I did do an interview yesterday, not with Arsenal Fan TV, with some Norwegian channel that wanted to know what it's like for foreign fans to um, to come watch the Premier League at the Emirates. Fuck and I gave you boys, I, I gave you boys a shout out too, you know, for people to come listen to the clock and talk. So fuck off for giving me shit when I'm <laughs> oh, the one oh, you doing all the PR. <laughs> you, re- you remembered you actually do this podcast, do you? you you're always, What's that supposed to mean? Well, you're always on bloody, um, what is it, Darren with his Indian, the Indian goon. Uh, I don't want to talk about what his podcast name is because I don't want to be bloody... <laughs> It's, but but not once you mentioned the clock and talk on his podcast. I have, of course, I have, and so has Darren. Uh, you told me you've never that. even heard the show, Tess, so I'm not going to take your word for this. <laughs> I did. I listen to Darren all the time. <laughs> uh, just not when I'm on there, is it? <laughs> as soon as he says Schwinn's on there, I turn off. <laughs> uh, all right okay. well, let's move on sandeep has another question for us and uh who does this one go to i think you Taz, right yep all right good win two clean sheets in a row hopefully we're on the up and up and emory has come to sense playing his best players thoughts on kolasinac and whether the coaching staff should look at improving his finishing skills so that he could be converted to a left midfielder or a left winger like gareth bale <laughs> uh, look, it's, uh, it is an interesting thought. 
but it's a pretty stupid thought as well. Uh, it's, I just, <laughs> I don't. It's, uh, fuck, I, I get where he's coming from because a lot of people see Klesnach. He, he, look, he's he's great at crossing. He's he's a big unit, but he just this is the guy who apparently got the. What is what do you get the best left back in the Bundesliga the for him? Team of the season, yeah. Uh, team of the season, and and uh, he, he's not a bail for starters. He, he would never be a bail. Um, he's good at what he does, a wing back. I think just leave him as a wing back, and that's as good as he. Uh, and there's probably a lot better wing backs than him. I I probably wouldn't have him in my top. Maybe top ten win backs. I don't, I don't want to ride the bloke off, but yeah, no. Nah, for me, no. I don't know. You boys might have a different thought. I, I don't know. Don't I mean, know not really. Or not twin. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have a different thought. I think uh, just to sort of explain that a bit more. I think what people forget about him is that you know it's very difficult and different to play with your back towards goal, and when you're higher up more often than not your back will be towards goal because you'll be looking to receive possession. Yes, you can be played in behind, but Kolasinac's biggest strength, even when it comes to attacking, is is using the momentum he picks up when he's in stride. Running and I think that... Exactly. And I think... And we saw that yesterday, you know, when he was bombarding down the wing and even when he made a couple of surges fall forward from central positions. And both on all... Most of those occasions, he, he made good things happen. In a couple of occasions, he created direct chances, as as Tony spoke about Lacazette's miss early on in the first half. And you you lose you, you lose that when you're playing higher up the pitch. And we haven't seen it yet. We have, of course saw it against City, but I don't think that's enough of a you know a sample space to make an assessment on it. But if I was a gambling man, I'd probably not not consider it because on the ball he can be pretty awful. You know, he makes he has a good delivery in him, but. Being an attacker is is a lot more than just delivering crosses, especially the way we play. And I, I wouldn't I wouldn't you know take that bet at all. Sorry, mate. I, I look. I've seen a few Arsenal fans say talk about this. Um, you know, it's an idea, and I get where everybody's coming from because he is good at what he does there. But nah, he just he too hard to get going. He, like you said, Shwin, he. he he can run forward at pace, but he just... Yeah, nah, not for me. I'm only stalling, so I can just get the next question up. <laughs> yeah, I figured. <laughs> Tony, uh, Tuera looked to be back to his near best today. Worked hard, kept running, and was solid in tackles. Maybe having had a rest over the past month when Gwendozi filling in has done him good. Uh, I mean, he was a lot better yesterday, but it was a lot easier game to play in. As I said, it was essentially done after 18 minutes. Um, so it's hard to tell. Yes, he was better. I don't know. I think he's been, I've said this so many times, I think he's been rested in a really weird way in that he's always travelled and he's played 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. Instead of just being completely rested, I don't really know what's going on with him. But So I can't really answer the, the full question. But yes, he was better yesterday. But it was an easier game to play in. You reckon it's to get his fitness up? Plays them 20-minute um, stints just to keep him fit and get his fitness going? I don't know, because for me, you'd get as much, if it's raw fitness that he's struggling with, I think you'd get as much. I, I don't think fitness is the issue. I think it's fatigue, because he's played in this, he's played all through the summer, which he's not used to. I think it was his first ever tournament. I may be wrong. Uh, he's also not had a winter break for the first time ever. So... I think it's just more fatigue. So, and and traveling takes it out of you. Like, he went to where, wherever Barte is, uh, Belarus, and played the last twenty minutes on a horrible pitch. Mm. That's for me. That's yeah. adding more to the fatigue. Like I, I've always said this: as I know a player always wants to play, but for me in that situation, it's better to leave him at home. Yeah, just leave him by. Yeah, even if he doesn't play. Again, forget the heavy pitch. You still got to go through the warm ups, and you're still not staying at home that night. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but you you sleep better in your own bed. Like when you've got your home comforts, you can go and have what you have for dinner. Like again, it all sounds so stupid, but it all adds up. Like being on the plane for four hours or however far it is, not getting back till late at night because you're coming back after the game, 
and then maybe having to train the next day because if, especially if you haven't played a full match they probably will have trained the next day um mm. so for me i just think he's been used in a really weird way um i, I don't think it's particularly helped um to, to combat obviously him playing all through the summer and, and the lack of winter break um, Tony, you're up for Schwinn. Uh, that RC fella. Uh, so the, yeah, the RC fella, his man of the match was Bernd Leno, and he looks forward to hear, hearing our thoughts about his performance in this match. For him, he's a very good shot stopper. This is along with the comfort of the ball at his feet. Should be a strong platform for him to be a world-class keeper in two to three seasons. Yeah, we sort of touched on this. Um, I agree with the shot stopper statement, as you know, obviously Tony spoke about it earlier. He made a couple of very, very good saves, of course, early on from Redmond. And I think Matt Target uh, also caught a volley at the edge of the box in the second half that uh, Leno made a very, very Hollywood save, shall we say, to keep that out of the net. But my issue, again, is with the kicking. Um, you, you'd expect him to dink a lot more balls into midfield. Uh, into whether central spaces or, or out wide. And uh, with, with even someone like Southampton pressing us, th- those spaces are usually open. But I, I found him playing a lot more balls, you know, to fullbacks. And he looks confident, as Tony said, but I have my doubts over his quality uh, just yet, which is obviously the opposite of what we had we'd been told all along. Man of the match might be a bit of a stretch. I think there were players who had, a, uh, who had better games than, than Leno. But... You know, if he doesn't make those saves, then then we're probably looking at splitting points for the day. So I can see why the RC fellow is going with that theory, but it wouldn't be my shout for man of the match. So just so when we was in the pub yesterday, and then Shrim was with me tagging along. Um, one one of my friends says he has a, a huge issue with people like Leno because if you're terrible, they know you know they need to be replaced. His problem with Leno is he feels he just does enough. And when you're like that, you're never going to improve on them because he just does enough. I, I think that's probably a little bit harsh, but I can see where that, that feeling comes from. That you're, ne- you're not going to replace him because he never does anything wrong. But you're never going to get to what you're never going to get someone spectacular if you don't place your, replace your average. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Schwinn. You're up. All right, Tez. Yep. Uh, this is from Sanchit. Who do you think starts for Bournemouth and Spurs? Ramsey or Mesut Ozil? Probably Ramsey. I, I, yeah, has to be, he, who knows with the count feed? Like, <laughs> mate, he's all over the shot. Give him the fucking armband one day and then drop him and just, just a cunt of an act at times. Um, yeah, just just to yeah. let you know, I mean, this might not change your response at all, but we play Bournemouth on Wednesday and then we play Tottenham this weekend. Does that change your answer at all? If just because they're within four four yeah, days. If anything, I think I just don't think he. Oh, it's something going on with him. I've said this a couple of times. Something's definitely going on. Right. Uh, and uh, but I just don't know what that something is because if you're going to sell Urzel in the summer. They need to play him to, to say, he's fucking brilliant, lads, give us 50 million. But at this rate, we're not even going to get that. So as we discussed the other week when we did our, did our things, we'll be safe, you know. Um, uh, look, he'll, he'll probably have to play, play him either Wednesday or the weekend. Um, I think he'll go Ramsey and then who, who's on the weekend we play after Tottenham. Tottenham. Nah, he'll, he'll go. I think he'll go as a Wednesday Ramsey against Tottenham. I think that's probably what he'll play. Did we beat, uh, when we beat Tottenham? Did he play Ramsey? Or no, he came on at half time. Yeah. So man, you just don't know what he's gonna do. Yeah, I, I think as a Wednesday. Neither of them at Tottenham. Yeah. But again, you, look, we're all stabbing in the dark because, as Tess said, you just you never know what's going to happen, and and sometimes that can be a good thing as long as the players know. And at times this season, it's looked like they haven't. But as long as the players know, it's fine because it'd be very hard for for Pochettino planning that game um, against us because I wouldn't be surprised if he goes back to a back five, Emery, um, against Tottenham away. 
but he could obviously we've had some successes for with four in our last two games, a back four. So if you're Emery, how I mean, if you're Pochettino, what what one do you make an allowance for, or do you not, and just go and play your own game and hope you win? Mm. I don't know. That's, I just don't know. The old nanny seems to be he's he's out the fucking door. He, he won't get a look in. I'm just trying to think. Uh, so, Ozil, Ramsey, Mkhitaryan's there or what? Uh, but does he go back uh, to his a, back five with three holding midfielders? Yeah, well, that's another thing. Does he play Dennis Suarez? Like, is he like getting? Is he getting match fit? And he thinks, oh, well, he's getting good. You know, there's absolutely no chance unless he comes on against Bournemouth or starts against Bournemouth and does some magic. There's absolutely no chance Suarez plays at Wembley. I think he'll play. I think he'll play against Bournemouth somewhere. I reckon he'll start somewhere. I mean, I, I figured the same for for against Southampton, but. We didn't see that happen either. And Bate. Again, and, and Bate for that matter. Yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. I mean, yesterday, he could have easily gotten 10 minutes or, or more, one could argue. But especially with Mesut Ozil coming on yesterday, we looked to threaten a bit more and we seem to create a bit more. So maybe that's, that's the sort of position you want to put a new player in so that you know they have a chance to increase their confidence. But Emery just doesn't seem to fancy him at the moment. Well, I don't, I don't, know, if it, I don't know if you saw this from your viewpoint, Schwinn, but... Um, they were the only three Ozil, Aubameyang and um, uh, Dennis Suarez that were really warming up seriously I, yeah. I think that it was probably pre-planned for them to be, be the three subs but then Lichsteiner going off meant only two of the three could come on that's true yeah I forgot about that to be honest yeah I saw Guendouzi was out there during half time as well but he was mostly just oh yeah I mean at half time they'll, time. Come, they'll just kick a ball around but I mean in terms of so they, what, what they do uh, after about 15 minutes, you're only allowed three players to warm up at a time. So one group of three players will come out, do five, ten minutes warming up, just jogging along the touchline. Then the other group of three will come out. In the second half, only the ones that really look like they're going to come on tend to warm up. Um, right. And it was pretty much Dennis Ozil and Aubameyang the whole time. Mm. So who fucking knows what he's going to do? Look, Dennis, I'm just more thinking of this Dennis Suarez deal. I just wonder whether it was just to shut the fans up. We we have to sign somebody to please the fans, and he's available on loan. He's going to cost us nothing. He'll he'll please the fans. He'll shut them up. I, I wonder if that's the case because he hasn't used him or done anything with him. Like at least I thought he would. Have, as you said, you boys said then start him against Barto. Oh, like oh, it's just very weird, mate. Old Emery's a bit of a fucking odd case, I think. He's on fucking on the fucking yoey or the ice or something at times, I think. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't do ice, kids. <laughs> Unless you want to become like Emery, I suppose. <laughs> oh, but he just he makes the strangest things at times. Strangest decisions, but yeah. Um, okay, this is going to be a bit of a tough one because I haven't even... Pre- Prepared for this, um, so if we want to go around the table with a player each, if you can think, M W A Gunner, he's asking, what's the worst Arsenal eleven in the Emirates era? Era, Tony. Oh wow. So I, mean, I can't sit here and name an eleven. I I know. Fucking There's always images going around where we played Santos, Skilacci, Giroud, Johan Giroud, and. Hey, hey, watch your mouth. <laughs> you liked him, Schwinn, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yeah. I mean, look, he wasn't the best signing, but he I don't think he features in the <laughs> in the worst guy. 11. He is a fucking the man dog. scored four goals at Anfield. I think that itself atones him. <laughs> fucking dud. <laughs> Fucker. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think who else. Oh, Javinia. Yeah. Pong. Sorry, he, 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 was, he was all right at Roma, funny enough, when he went there. He's still scoring in Syria, isn't he? He scored against Juventus yeah, the other week. Yeah, yeah beat, beat Juventus. Yeah. But he was a bit of a dart at Arsenal, wasn't he? Who else? Yeah, it was fair. In Ali Adair's had Premier League minutes. So, I mean, Bettner. It's endless. So we should have done a bit of homework. Try it. Yeah. You said Santos, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, he's probably the worst left back we've had in the Emirates era. Mm. You got any, Schwinn? I'm trying to think of a goalkeeper. 
Uh, Almunia, would he qualify as Emirates era? Yeah, he was definitely in the Emirates era. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Almunia would be another one, I suppose. Um, what about that that Japanese that? kid, Ryo oh, Miyaichi? Did he ever rack up? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I. I I, when I've named mine, I haven't included players that played one or two games, which is pretty much what he done. Yeah, that um, was going to be my next question, hey, whether he that, played enough games. Who was that big black cunt who fucking was signed from Monaco? Yeah. You're not thinking of Diaby, are you? Nah, back in the no- late 90s. I just can't think of his fucking name. Yeah, big black cunt. Can't think of him. From Monaco, at a bio. Yeah. Fuck. I'd have already scored a lot of goals for us, though. I mean, no, 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 the... no, no, I wasn't him. I can't think of him now. I'm pretty sure this player doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not Monaco, Tez. Maybe you no, think of a different was, team. That was definitely Monaco. That's a big black cunt. Chris something? Chris? Chris? We had Chris Ware uh, Chris that was, Chris Chris uh, Chris uh, It's not coming to me It's late 90s anyway He only played about 50 odd games for us I think By memory mm. Yeah anyway I can't yeah, I mean there's I like been a fair look There's been a fair bit Of players who Could easily make this list we're just not prepared enough, I suppose. I'm just Googling. Big black cunt who played for Arsenal in late <laughs> 90s from Monaco. <laughs> Let's see what comes up. <laughs> Big black This is what happens. Oh, no. This is what happens when you do your homework during class. Do not type in big black cunt in Google. Holy <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm still pretty sure this player doesn't exist. Christopher Ray, W R E H from Monaco, yeah. three hundred K. Signed in summer of nineteen ninety seven and played, yeah, played forty six yeah, games. Bad for us. He won the league. Yeah, but I was one. That's why I was thinking, would you add him in your eleven? I was just trying no, to rattle. No, I mean, yeah. also ninety seven is definitely not the Emirates era. No, no, so I'm a bit older than you, cunts. I remember him. He scored some key goals in the, the that season we won the league, mm. ninety eight. Yeah, no, that was that was a bloke I was thinking of. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, that's good. I don't have to think of that fucking bleak black cunt name now more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Schwinn, no Tony. I just asked you that, didn't I? So you guys, why, Tony? Yeah, I mean, Schwinn went out of order with his question, so it's kind of all over the place. I um, fucking thought he did, queer cunt. Yeah. What I do he's, wrong? He's probably blocked MAA Gunner, so he can't see. Oh, so I, all I, his I, questions. I can. Yeah. I can. I, I, the first question I threw was the fucking MAA Gunner question, boys. The, the, yeah, the yeah, Bournemouth you one. Him, you don't like him. <laughs> the Bournemouth um, one, you fucking <laughs> threw me under the bus because it was out of whack. Yeah. No, I mean it popped up on my on my thread uh, in that order, so that's why I did. Here, anyway, I'll I'll get us back in order. I'll throw the next question. Um, Tony, why don't you answer this one? How do you know you're not order, gonna... buddy, all the queer cunt that went out of order? How do you know no, you're gonna throw us back in order? Sure. <laughs> all right, well, I'm asking this next, next question. Let's see where it is. <laughs> okay, in terms of finishing, who's better, Mkhitaryan or Aubameyang? I swear it takes a million shots before they can score. Um, you are in order, but um, yeah. I, I don't get like why are we criticising our top scorer? Like, just what is the need? And Mikatarian yesterday, did he have any wild shots or shots that you thought he really should have scored that he didn't? I don't remember any. Nah, not really. So, like, just again, what is the need? And the Bamiyang had one shot blocked uh, that he sent the keeper the wrong way. He was going in. I just, I don't get it. Like. We can all sit here and criticise players, but you're criticising someone who's probably had his best game in ages, our top scorer. Just like, what, what's the point? Mm. It is, yeah. I agree with you. It's, 
But but I, once again, I, I do see his point, and he, he he's probably thinking that we do have a million fucking shots. We can never seem to get that third goal as well. Like, but yeah, I mean, score, but, score. okay, we, we can we can criticize the Bamiyang's finishing, but how many of the twenty Premier League teams were taken? Probably all of them, oh, maybe absolutely. not. Yeah. That city. Yeah. So it ain't that bad, is it? No, no, no. Well, I wonder what his um, goal strike rate, conversion rate thing is. I know earlier in the season he was well above XG, but. I think Arsenal was a club where at that point I don't know if we still are. Wow, look at look at this. Tony talking about XG. No, it's because we had all done now. it. We done it after one of the things. I remember looking at the table because we was proving you wrong that XG was bullshit. And I remember <laughs> having the uh, table in front of me. But it, just, just, one of them things like you only need to score one good goal and your XG is going to be crazily high because if you score a goal where it's like zero point one percent chance then you're like 0.99 ahead. You're never really going to lose that. You'd have to yeah. lose, miss two penalties to just be back either. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the takeaway from this should be that he, they're getting shots off. You know, for the last few weeks, we weren't able to create, which meant we weren't getting good shots off. Now at least we're, you know, we're getting back into the rhythm where we're able to not just create chances, but get a lot of shots off and, and test the goalkeeper. And to be fair to Angus Gunn, I think he made a couple of crucial sh- saves yesterday that could have been goals for Aubameyang. So well, he, he made he made two good saves from Lacquer, a header from a corner and a one low down. It was it was kind of straight at him, but when they're low by your feet, they're and hard because Lacquer can kick a ball hard. They're, they're difficult to save. Well, just the, yeah. just to go through, so he's got he's 26 matches, uh, 15 goals, four assists. Um, 27 shots on tar- 27 shots on target with 54%. That is very good for yeah. a striker who you can't complain with that, no. can you? Yeah, that, that is very very good. I'd say, especially this time of the season when you know there's a lot of games that have been played. Yeah, so 20 yes, so you, 27 shots on target, 15 15 goals scored. Yeah, 54%. I'm trying to look for an off target, but I can't. I mean, yeah, I mean, my argument was would be he's not had enough shots. Not he doesn't score enough of the shots he has. Yeah, I agree with you. They don't have an off target, but that's look that's on target. So I I imagine there might be some off targets that people are thinking. Uh, shit, he's he's got one off target again. That's the only. No, there's, there's no doubt he's missed chances, but I wouldn't say he's an awful finisher. No, goals inside mm. the box, thirteen of fifteen. Yeah, Tottenham and Cardiff were the other ones. Mm. Goals outside the box, two of fifteen. There you go. Goals scored on penalties, only two goals by penalties. Okay. But let's just say that we, we would take those numbers over not taking those numbers. Absolutely. And now, now, now have a look at your fucking... I oh know a couple of fucking lover boys out there. Have a look at Giroud. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> look, Giroud was okay, but like, he's not a Bamiyang. Yeah, but to be fair, there's very few players in the world that are Aubameyang. He's yeah, but that's what I mean. There's very few players at him, but we still want to moan about him for some yeah, reason. That's what I'm saying. We, we shouldn't be criticising. I was top. Yeah, I was agreeing with you. Just in a roundabout way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, oh, sorry. I was going to well, Me? Uh, so, forget the Czech derby. I'm not sure what the Czech derby is. Chelsea, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the upcoming round of the Europa League tie is about Ben Arthur versus Emery. This for me mm. or Schwinn? Well, it's not really a question, is it? No. I don't even know. I don't even understand it. Sorry, I'm double like, I, I What's the Czech derby? I'm assuming us against Chelsea. I think. I okay. it must be. Okay. Ben the, them games done. Don't yeah, know why well, I'm you thinking. said that Ben Afra versus Emery. So yeah, let's move on. Yeah. Well, I'll do the next one. Uh, can't wait to see Schwinn share his wisdom on AFTV. <laughs> <laughs> I like oh, the comment. Face, mate. I like the comment by that RC fella. He better not. <laughs> <laughs> Classy. He better not. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Since but... the RC fella says he better not, I guess I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> That's a warning. <laughs> uh, M double A Gunner also says, "Look what happens when you put round pegs in round holes." There, we win two 0 
Yeah, here, here. Okay. And still somehow ma- managed to make the second half completely painful. Well, not completely, but painful. Mm. Okay, Schwinn, you you can go after that MWI gunner. Oh God! This gunner, so count, gunner, gunner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Yo, Yep. What's Colonel say, mate? Yeah, <laughs> okay. What's Colonel say? All right, Shaq has importance. Is so underrated. I finally seen the light. Tez, you're a genius. More forward passes and possession within midfield. Unsung hero? Question mark. We can move on, Tony. Just throw the next question at me. <laughs> what, what was it? What did he say again? Tez, you're what? Tez's computer is now covered in seam. <laughs> And it's not a picture of David. <laughs> Look, Kernos, I, I appreciate it, mate. I, I I like to wear the genius tag every now and then, my friend. So thank you very much. Kind words and, but, um, yeah, you're a good bloke. I mean, take aside the genius bit, which is obviously moronic. But <laughs> it, it, it's, no, but it's true. Like, Jacka does bring so much and people always want to see the negatives. And obviously, Tez has beaten the drum much harder than others. But it's good to see that people are recognising what he gives us is not just what he doesn't give us or what he doesn't offer. Um, because I, had to, I mean, I think we all pretty much feel he's a major part of the team and, and we're a better team with him in it. Moon, you had a conversation during the week, Tony, about, um, you know, the, the who scored ratings and people look at assists and goals and things and that's where they shine the light. And I think I even said to you, like, uh, you know, on ratings, how do you... I said to you, I said, look, fuck, I'd, I'd probably think, and, okay, let's start your rating at a five. If you get an assist, it's got to be worth one. If you get a goal, it's probably got to be worth, you know, a goal and assist, probably another two. You're at about an eight. Uh, to, uh, you know, at a point, you to a point, you get ten, you know. But a, a granite, I thought about it after the conversation. I'm thinking, but a granite, how would I, under my way, I'd be awarding him a five every week and then, would that be good? Even and you brought up the point to error as well. So these are the players that people don't actually see what they actually do because they don't get them goals and assists, and it, it, it makes that bloody rating scale very hard to score. Yeah, uh, as I said, they, they get unsung, and it's it's stuff that never gets brought up passing the ball to a teammate. It's never like rated, but but Jacker doesn't. And for me, it's more the speed he passes at. I know he's a slow mover, but he moves the ball very quickly, um, which makes it harder to intercept well, most of the time. Mm-hmm. No, he's good, and, and Kernos, you're a good bloke, mate, and I am a fucking genius, champ. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we got one here from MAA Gunner. Oh, just fuck me, Dad. Look at this guy. <sighs> do you think Maitland Niles could do a job in? Granite's role and possibly better than the Swiss god Tony uh, not the same role he could play centre mid and it would be in a very different way uh, he's more he'd pace direct running with the ball they're, they're complete opposites in a sense uh, they're both a bit careless with the passing but Xhaka's range of passing is levels and levels above uh, they offer completely different things. I remember we had this debate a lot last year when Jekyll wasn't playing too well and everyone wanted Maitland Nars starting there. And I said then I wouldn't prefer it. Uh, I'd still prefer Xhaka there, but I think it, Maitland Nars could do a job there, but it'd be in a different way, a very different way. Hmm. Have we seen him play there? <laughs> uh, Man United away, Austerlands, I think both home and away, and a couple of other Europa League games. Is that his position anymore? Oh, he's probably played. Know, if you asked him where he wants to play, he would say there. But you, you you play when and where the manager tells you, unless until we get to the next question. Mm. Oh, yeah, you ask the next question. Uh, so, what's your thoughts on Kepa? Uh, this is sorry from MWA Gunner. Uh, for me, he made the game interesting, even though it took 118 minutes for it to happen. Uh, is this the May or Schwinn? Well, I'm not sure if Schwinn's still pissing, so yeah. Okay. Oh, um, look, for me, it's... Oh, I think I think it, the manager has lost the dressing room. And I spoke to Glenn about this today, and uh, Glenn had a different opinion than me. But but I think 
it's come out now that it was all meant to be accidental and whatnot. So that's that's obviously 24 hours after this question's been asked, 16 hours. But um, for me, I, that, when I first seen it, I thought he's he's lost the dressing room. Like, what player just doesn't come off and sits there and argues with the manager? There's no respect. Uh, you're not you don't listen to your manager, and I would have been fucking dragging him off the fucking field so I know you know I know there's rules around that players can they don't have to come off and I think the ref can uh, issue a yellow card but and it's only for time wasting it's nothing to do with you know code of conduct or anything it's or, or with the players having a sook, it's more 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 time wasting. So it's it's up to the manager and the players. So yeah, at first I would have thought, I thought, Sarri, you've lost the dressing room, my friend. Things have changed now, so it's come out and said that didn't mean to happen. Apparently, so I, I don't know, Tony. Yes. What, what are you going? Safe and face PR for me is an absolute disgrace. Like. They, like, they've come out and said it's a misunderstanding. It's absolutely not. But you have to say face. There's, the, there's no good way of coming out of it. That's probably the best way to, to go around it. Say, oh, yeah, we just we misunderstood each other, blah, blah, blah. For me, it's ridiculous. I mean, look, Sarri is probably not going to be there after the summer anyway. And, and Kepa probably knew that. But it is unacceptable. But not also not only from Kepa. Obviously, he is the main, the main candidate of who's unacceptable. But Sarri's got to put his foot down and make the sub happen. But also the other senior players, like I was listening to a radio phone in as I was driving home last night. And and they're saying, do you think, like again, this goes back to our argument that captains don't really exist anymore. Do you think that happens with John Terry in, in the team? I can tell you it doesn't. John Terry would pick Kepper up and walk him off the pitch if he had to. Mm-hmm. And and I, I read another thing from a Chelsea That's a pundit. Good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. And I read another thing from a Chelsea pundit who said... Um, another issue is Aspilicueta it's like a Spanish mafia there Aspilicueta has backed the keeper because he's a Spanish teammate rather than the manager which again is also unacceptable from Aspilicueta and I really like Aspilicueta but if true it's shocking David Luiz has come out and said that he told Ariza Bilaga to go off and he said no so again that's just a lack of respect for teammates mm. and and senior teammates as well it's not like it no, was ha- Hudson Odoi telling him to go off. It was someone that I think has probably captained the club at some point. Mm. But I mean, so, uh, and when I was saying talking to Glenn today, and he, you know, he was saying, "I oh, but this is the player chucking a dummy spit." You know, like this is fucking bullshit. Like he, he was a grunt, but I was, I was, I'm adamant. There's no respect to the manager and the manager. I think Sarri has lost the dressing room. That just, you just can't get away with that. I'd be getting rid of him for the rest of the season now. I'd be saying, mate, you fucking sit on that bench for the rest of the season. You're now my number two goalkeeper. Yeah, I mean, it's a keeper they paid a world record fee from on an eight-year contract. They're not going to piss him off. And Sarri might want to try piss him off, but I can tell you who loses that battle. Mm. Again, it's, it's like I've said about Emery many times. It's a battle he simply cannot win. Him and Ozil. But he should have. He should have put his foot down and dragged him off the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. So he had the option to. The ref even came over the way it ended. The ref came over and said, "What do you want to do?" And he's obviously said to the ref, "I'll oh, leave him on there." Mm. He tells the ref he wants him off. The player comes off. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fucking bullshit. Right, uh, um, Schwinn, you back? I am. No, no, Tony, you want to follow one of him? Uh, oh, it's for me. It's for me. Yeah. I don't know, we've answered it. So Schwinn asked it at the start. Oh, OK. Uh, so just that was Shree's question uh, about Monchi, but we asked that at the start. Um, so we're on to Clayco Conservative. I hate to nitpick such a good team win, but why do we always seem to struggle to get that fir- third goal cushion? Would have benefited immensely this week with two more games in quick succession. And if Lich misses time, would you prefer Musti? Ainsley or Gunnosaurus himself at right back <laughs> I mean the, the first part of the question we've, you've spoken about this before um, in today as well I, I think Southampton made some good changes to be fair um, I thought the switch the back four in the second half helped them and it took us a while to get used to it and then, then find some lanes to get get through them 
Um, Mesut Ozil's introduction helped in that regard. I think we were instantly better once he was introduced and he was able to find some passing lanes, some intricate play as well on the wings that helped. But all in all, the question still stands. I think we do struggle sometimes. And to Tony's point, I think it's to do with a bit of pacificity. You know, we're comfortable. Maybe there's a bit of professionalism going on there. Okay, we won't score because we know you're not interested. But it's this is, this is not how we're going to secure our top four spot. We need to, you know, maximize whatever we can to ensure that with that top four spot in the league. And goal difference, as mentioned earlier, is going to be a, a key facet in that. As for the right back, look, I, I'd want Ainsley in there. I'm not sure what the extent of his fitness and injury are, but that that would be my preferred choice. Um, Lichtstein did hop off with an injury. Um, do we have an update on, on what's going on with him? No, I don't. I have not looked. Yeah, I don't think the club have come out either uh, and, and said anything. It, it is too early, to be fair. So maybe over the next day or two, we'll find out a bit more as to what's going to happen there. But Ainsley would be my my go-to pick for that position. All right, let's move on because we have a few questions left and we've gone over for quite a while. Um, Tess, this is from Bendit Like Bentner. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think we can have some positives about Lacazette being banned from uh, the Europa League games? Um, do you yeah, think... Okay, so uh, so obviously, you're going to start with um, Abemyang, but my only worry is, is Abemyang played up front against Tottenham and we won. Abemyang also played with the United draw, I think. He was starting up front. My only... Lacazette played up front against the Chelsea win. So, uh, look. Didn't they, did they both play against Chelsea? Oh, that's why I was not real sure. That's why I just... Yeah, I think they, they did. They, did, they yeah. both played. So, you know, Aubameyang's been tested in these big games against these, you know, on these these teams. You know, the, okay, the Man United game, it was a, obviously a 2-2 draw, but the, that's my only worry, to be honest, is... I think I would rather a, a Bemiang up front against a Tottenham more so than, and that's in two weeks. So he's saying when we play oh, a, week. We, a week. So when do we play this Europa League game? It's through two, three After weeks. After Tottenham. After Tottenham. So he won't, yeah. So a Bemiang, I, I couldn't imagine a Bemiang starting at Tottenham. It'll be Lacazette, which and that's 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 my only worry. I think a Bemiang's probably better than Lacazette at the bigger games. But I'm looking for a positive, aren't I? Lacazette, I think, has scored more goals though in against the big sides. If I'm not wrong, yeah, he has. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but your point stands says that in a lot of those situations, Aubameyang has been on the pitch, which in itself. Is, is a big factor that you cannot exclude from the conversation because, you know, he puts the fear of God in, in a lot of defenders, which frees up space, arguably, for, for Lacazette. It'll be interesting. I think we might see um, one of them against Bournemouth, but I wouldn't be surprised if Embry takes a punt. I know we don't have any backup strikers other than Eddie, but uh, against these big games, uh, against these big teams, which, are, which could be considered classic six-pointers, would be surprised if Emery takes a punt and plays both of them. Yeah, well, Lacazette's... Well, sorry, Tony, but, yeah, Lacazette... So when he's played his games, he's he's been... Aubameyang's played that on the wing there, so... That, that's something that worries me. I don't, I don't know if I see a positive in it. I was just going to say, I think if he does play both against Tottenham, he goes ultra-negative elsewhere, so there'd probably only be one other attacking player, probably a Wobie known Emery, but be it Ozil, be it Ramsey be it Mickey um, and then he goes ultra negative with, with everyone else I think that's the only way that they could play together at Wembley mm. well for me Tottenham is a must win game that's our must win game in the next two weeks boys oh. and, and, look, and it's not because it's Tottenham I don't care if it's Burnley or what it is but I'm concentrating on the Premier League at the moment I want I want to win the next I want to win Bournemouth and even if it wasn't Tottenham the following week, I want to win them two get next two games. I want we want six points, and then we put the pressure, and then that puts the pressure on your Man United and Chelsea. And that's that's and it's not, I'm not saying that because of Tottenham, but I, I just yeah I want to win the next. I want to win every every game going in the Premier League. We've only got the two 
two hard ones is, um, I think, is Man United and uh, Tottenham. Where the Everton other away, yeah, Wolves yes. away. I don't fancy either of them, to be honest. Who's Who was that? Sorry, Everton. Everton away and Wolves away. Yeah, yeah they are a bit worried too. Mm, so, they let's say yeah, four games is, yeah. But, but the, you know, Tottenham and Man United are obviously the tougher games. Oh, of course. Mm. Okay, um... We got one here, Tony from Sur- oh, fucking Sura. Uh, what would your reaction be if Leno had just done what Kepper had considered the replacement? Check is considerably worse. Well, I mean, I just start off that the reason he wanted to bring Caballero on is his penalty record is a lot better than Arifa Belaga's. Um, so, although he's a considerably worse keeper, with one minute to go, you're only thinking about the penalties. Um, if so, if we go down that same situation, we can't because checks awful from penalties. But imagine he wasn't. Uh, I would be. Dist- I don't know how, uh, as a fan that's there, I don't know how a display I was horrified with Leno because if you start booing, it looks like you're booing the substitution or whatever. But I'd be very fucking angry uh, with Leno if he'd done the same. Yeah, I'd argue with that. I'd argue, man. It's just no respect. It just comes down to respecting your manager for me, and there was no respect at all, none whatsoever. So I'd be, I'd be dirty, mate. I'd be dirty, and like, like I said about Ramsey, hats off to Ramsey. I'd be dirty as if he turned up and he's fucking head down and he's asshole like fucking Sanchez. You know that cunt, and he used to fucking roll up and his lip was down to the ground like some fucking uh, just a waste of space, cunt. You know, fuck off, get out of the club. That's what my thoughts are on them. I'm not going to have a fucking go, fuck off. But no, I'd be, piss- <laughs> be pissed off. <laughs> I'll be fucking pissed off. <laughs> uh, them last couple of games before Sanchez left, I remember them. I'll argue the last nine months. Yeah, well, yeah, nine months. But, you know, there were some performances there where you just could see that he just, yeah. But we kept playing him. Um... Tony, you're up for Schwinn. Yeah, so I think it's the last question um, because the others have been answered. Was the defensive performance overrated with the amount of chances Southampton created? Yes, I, I would say so. Um, I, I, I mean, you could make a case either way because I think we depended well in, in, moment, in key moments. Some good blocks, of course, a couple of good saves from Leno. But the way Southampton were shaping up and the way they were playing, we, we really shouldn't have given them that, you know, th- those openings. But, I mean, in the Premier League, it's really hard to argue uh, that a team's going to come in and, and not create chances, especially when, you know, we know we're that bad in defense. So, yes, overrated, but I don't think by a whole lot. I think we did well when we were supposed to, and I'd argue that our, our defenders had a decent game, especially going forward. So, I think that that does enough for them to atone for you know the mistakes they made or the openings they left for Southampton players. Okay, um, right. Eh? Thank you everybody for your questions, and as always, you can get them at clock and underscore talk on Twitter. That was that was pretty good, Schwin. I reckon that was a better way to do them questions. Yeah, yeah, a bit more conversation and not just volleying back and forth. And of course, another way to get you involved instead of just letting you be on mute while me and Tony are blithering on about. Yeah, enjoy that, Tony? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, that was good. Um, so th- thank you, everybody, for your questions. And as always, you can email us too at uh, a clock and talk. Yeah, at gmail.com. <laughs> so I'm fucking, where am I? Okay, boys, um, before we go, I want some quick predictions because we're going to come back after Bournemouth. Yeah, I've got time. I don't know what Beavers is doing. I might not be available, boys. Okay, so we'll see how we go. He's on the Indian podcast, so we'll let him know <laughs> that one. And all just let Darren know we say g'day. <laughs> and, um, also, just having heard your accent when you're on the phone this week, do you, when you're on the Arsenal India podcast, do you put on your accent? Because then it may be worth listening to. <laughs> and you might have to listen to find out. <laughs> I mean, you know that's not <laughs> um, Tony, quick prediction for Bournemouth? There'll be a football match. <laughs> I don't know, I'm 
did. That's my prediction. Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> 22 players will play football a couple of subs might play a few fans will be there ok who scores footballers <laughs> <laughs> or maybe no footballers and it's 0-0 <laughs> yeah hey, Schwinn prediction uh, there'll be a football match and I'll be at it <laughs> <laughs> you fucking, fucking just, uh, just again just so everyone knows how humble Schwinn is um, he's sitting in club level with his prawn sandwich on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> this is coming from the guy who'll be sitting next to me with another prawn sandwich in his hands. Ah, look at the lad he does, eh? Kicking it up, boys. Kicking it up, sipping champagne. When him, uh. when him row. <laughs> did he pay for that, Tom? Huh? Did, you, did he pay for you? What, for the club level tickets? Yeah. No, I got them. Oh, fucking hell. Uh, yeah, I'm a great host. Uh, good bloke, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Can't argue with that. Although I did, I did treat him out for a meal. So that's very true. Did you go to Heston's? Uh, not yet. I'm doing that on Friday. Uh, good. Tony's going to be there. He can't wait for a four thousand dollar meal. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking forward to it. <laughs> He's gonna. Are you gonna drive the Ferrari, Shui? Uh, no, I haven't rented a, a Ferrari this time. Although I, I am in the hunt for an Alfa Romeo. So if any of our listeners know someone I can grab one off of, I'd be very happy to. Hey, you bet. This is an Arsenal podcast, not fucking you. You throwing out your fucking I want the Alfa from Romeo fucking podcast. <laughs> I'll, I'll pay use for it. it. <laughs> the next and saying, the next <laughs> yeah, he's, he's this cunt's for? <laughs> uh, okay. All right, Let's... give us a prediction, Taz, and wrap it up. Oh, I've got to give you a prediction. <laughs> Arsenal 3-0 We'll get the third goal 3-0 right. Did you go What prediction did you do On the um, tweet that you put out Last week, Tom? You know I you, wouldn't have done a prediction No, no, when you did the You know that tweet What do you have us Do you have us Coming fourth or fifth? Oh, win Oh, I had a six But uh, win Oh, six, win Okay there you go, I got something out here. <laughs> okay, boys. I'm um, not <laughs> yeah. well, might, We might speak to Schwinn if he can make it. We might. We will be back on Friday. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for downloading. And thank you for subscribing. Um, if you get five seconds, hit us on a review on iTunes. That would be great. More people will find us um, yeah, each and every week. We enjoy doing this podcast, and thank you, everybody, for participating on the questions and making it such a wonderful show for you good people. Um, okay, guys, thanks. I'm just rambling on now. Okay, thanks, boys. <laughs> See you later. Cheers. Cheers.